Good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure for me to be here to speak to you about a space mission, something that will take you uh, a bit away from uh, computers and data centers. So first, before I start, I'd like to do a little test. So who of you has heard of ESA well, before this morning? Wow, that's a lot of people. Very good. OK. Uh, who of you had heard of Bepi Colombo before this morning? OK, a bit less. It's not unexpected, but we'll sort that out today. So just first, a, a little word about uh, ESA. So all of you have heard of it. You know it's an uh, intergovernmental organization of uh, 22 member states. It has, um, it's not dissimilar to the EU, but we are not actually uh, belonging to the EU. Uh, we have member states that overlap largely with the EU member states with uh, some small differences, like Switzerland with one of our member states, and Norway. Uh, we also have a collaboration agreement with Canada. Uh, and many other uh, co collaboration agreements with some other uh, EU nations uh, from the Eastern Europe, for instance. We have a yearly budget of roughly 5.7 uh, billion euros, and we employ roughly 2,300 people. Uh, we have centers spread over Europe. Our headquarters are in Paris, and uh, the center I'm working is in Darmstadt in Germany. We also have a big technological center in the Netherlands, in Le uh, near Leiden and some other centers spread uh, over Europe and assets over the world. Um, we are responsible for member states for uh, developing things related to space in many different domains, from uh, scientific research, uh, Earth observation and interplanetary science, robotic science, exploration, uh, going to Mars, also with humans, so we, we deal with uh, manned space flight issues. Um, we also have applications. We uh, have activities in the telecom, uh, navigation, um, and launchers, of course. So we, we cover a very, very wide uh, range of uh, space-related activities. And of course, we collaborate with other international organizations, such as uh, NASA, or at the European level, uh, DLR, or uh, the French uh, Space Agency, CNES. Uh, the, the group I work in, in Darmstadt, we have a very cool job. We are responsible for flying the robotic uh, solar system exploration missions of the agency. And uh, our portfolio ranges from the Sun to Saturn, more or less. And this gives you an overview of where we've all been. So I'll give you a few highlights, maybe. So we, we are, have and are preparing some missions exploring the Sun. We'll talk about BEPI close to Mercury today. We had an orbit around Venus that uh, is now uh, finished. We have a few uh, science missions around the Earth, uh, uh, studying the interaction with the solar wind. We have two orbiters around Mars that act also as relay for international assets, such as American rovers. Uh, we landed on a comet through Rosetta, actually both the Philae lander and the spacecraft itself. Uh, we are preparing a super cool mission to uh, Jupiter, which is called JUICE, with a launch due in 2022. And uh, we uh, landed on one of Saturn's moon, Titan, with Huygens in a very nice mission collaboration with uh, the Cassini NASA mission. So we, we have a very large uh, portfolio, and uh, this group has been active for now several decades. So today we'll talk about Bepi Colombo. With Bepi Colombo, we want to explore Mercury. Mercury is a planet that's still full of mysteries. It's the closest planet to our parent star. It's been visited so far twice by man-made assets. The first time is by Mariner 10, an American mission in the 70s that flew by, actually, three times. Uh, it was awesome at the time. They mapped about 45% of the planet and made unexpected discoveries. But then uh, we had to wait until 2011, until the next spacecraft enter into orbit around Mercury. That was an American mission named Messenger that in the meanwhile has also finished and um, hard landed on the planet itself in 2015. They also uh, map completely the planet, return awesome data, close a few questions, open plenty of new ones, as is very common in our field, and will be the next ones. Now, it's taking a while because, as you will hear from me today, it's actually not easy to get to Mercury, um, even with today's technology. Mercury itself uh, is characterized by very large temperature ranges, from minus 180 degrees Celsius to 450 or so at the surface. So you can compare that to the pizza oven. This is the environment in which we will fly. We'll talk more about that. Uh, it has a magnetic field. Uh, it has a lot of interesting geological features on the surface. It doesn't have an atmosphere. It has a very, very thin exosphere that allows direct interaction between the surface of the planet and the solar wind. So as such, it's very representative for scientific topics such as exoplanet study, 
uh, which is very uh, common today, which is the study of planets around their parent star and studying the conditions for the emergence of life. As such, it's also very interesting to study the evolution of our own solar system. Um, how did the planets uh, get to what they are today? How could they evolve in the future? What does that mean for us here on Earth? And ultimately, the good old topic of uh, where is life coming from? Where could life be going? What is the diversity of life, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Um, so that's more or less the goal we've set for ourselves. And this is our spacecraft. So as we mentioned before, BP Colombo has a characteristic to be a, a collaborative mission with a Japanese space agency, JAXA. Um, it's not unusual for us to have collaborative agreements with other agencies for our missions. I mean, uh, Rosetta or uh, Cassini-Huygens were uh, very collaborative missions with the Americans, for instance. But in this case, what's very peculiar is that we fly two spacecraft in one. So basically, the terms of the arrangement with the Japanese is that we fly two independent uh, orbiters to Mercury. This is the Japanese one, the Mercury Magnetospheric Orbiter. They uh, gave it a name, MIO. Um, and this is ours, the Mercury Planetary Orbiter, MPO. We didn't give it another fancy name. Uh, and when we arrive at Mercury, these two we fly independently from each other in two different orbits, and they will return data that is com complementary for science. So it, it's quite nice because we'll have in situ at the same time two uh, uh, independent spacecraft returning data points at the same time in various uh, places in the Mercury environment. Now, the other cool uh, thing about this mission is that we uh, actually use a transfer stage to get there. So transfer stage, it's not unusual, it's what a rocket does, right? I mean, in a rocket, you basically have several stages. Each stage is exhausts its fuel, and once it's there, you get rid of it and continue with the next one. Well, you can think of this as a further stage, additional to the rocket. This one will stay with us for seven years. It's uh, responsible for taking us through the solar system up, up until the point where we will enter into orbit around Mercury. Um, and as I will tell you more in detail later, it carries uh, mainly propulsion, and in particular, electric propulsion, which is also one novel aspect of this mission. So the idea is we made all these things together. This is a sun shield because MIO doesn't like, um, it, it's a spinner actually, so around Mercury it will rotate around its axis. During the cruise, we here, we're three axis stabilized. We will always keep the same orientation towards the sun. Mio will not like this, so we give it a support structure there to shield it from the sun um, so that it's uh, comfy and not too hot and doesn't damage its solar cells. So we made all this together. We make a stack out of it. We launch it. They get married for seven years, and then we split it apart seven years later. I, I'll, I'll tell you how. Um, a quick word about our scientific complements. This is very important. That's why we do all this. So MPO carries 11 instruments. You can think of it as um, a planetary research lab. It has everything typically you'd like to have when you go and study a planet going into orbit and not landing. Landing would be tricky. Um, so we have spectrometers in various bands, uh, in the old frequencies you can think of. Uh, we have a magnetometer here mounted on a boom. We have sensors to also monitor what comes from the sun, because as I mentioned before, we want to also uh, understand better the interaction between Mercury and the solar wind, because this is causes some processes um, that we want to understand better. So we have some sensors here uh, to detect solar flares and measure what's coming from the sun. Um, and we have also uh, an instrument that wants to do extremely precise orbit determination for the purpose of, uh, among other things, uh, also verifying Einstein's theory of relativity. So they can, they can reconstruct the uh, orbit, the ephemeris of Mercury in extremely great detail uh, to, to, uh, to a level where you can detect relativistic effects. So this is all very cool. Then we have MIO. MIO is a bit smaller, so it carries a bit less, but still uh, it's about half a dozen of instruments uh, with multi-sensor suits. And MIO is more de uh, dedicated to the study of the magnetic field of Mercury and its interaction with the sun and the solar wind as well. So its instruments are more focused to this type of science. This was built by European industry for the European part. Of course, uh, the Japanese have their own. So um, the building was under uh, architecture from uh, Airbus Defense and Space, the center uh, based in Friedrichshafen on the Bodensee, very nice place. And then they worked with uh, subcontracts from industry all over Europe, and okay, some contribution from the US and Japan as well, 
Um, uh, we are talking about maybe of the order of 70 subcontracts because in ESA we have a rule of geo return. So when we uh, grant a contract for uh, a spacecraft of, of this amount, we'll talk about money in a minute, um, we want that there is a, a relatively balanced return through all of our member states. It's a very important rule within, within ESA. Um, talking about money, um, well, the mission, believe it or not, costs each one of us as EU citizen a mere 2.5 euro for covering activities uh, over a time span of nearly 25 years. This does not include the price of the uh, scientific instruments themselves, which are paid by national agencies. This is the way we operate, basically. So they furnish the payload, and we furnish everything else. So this is uh, the, the price. So it amounts to roughly 1.3 billion euros from cradle to grave, so from when, when it was conceived to, to the end. The idea was born in the 90s, 93. The scientists really wanted to go to Mercury. They felt the time was ripe for doing so. At the time, Messenger was not yet in the papers on the American side, so we were hoping to be the first ones after Marina 10, which would have been really cool. Um, and then the mission was approved in 2000, the same year where the Americans decided to do Messenger. Um, okay, and then we made different technological choices that implied that it took us longer because, okay, we decided to make, a bit, <laughs> make it a bit hard for ourselves. Uh, and uh, finally, last year we launched uh, when their mission is finished, but we are very complementary because we made these different technological choices. So this is uh, pictures of uh, the, the, the craft. So you can see here the three modules I introduced, uh, the transfer module MTM, the MPO, and MIO with a support structure here. Uh, maybe I should point out here a few interesting features. So this is our high gain antenna. It's uh, a one meter diameter dish. So probably, I don't know if some of you are familiar with the way we talk to our satellites. It goes via radio frequency. In this case, X-band for the uh, telemetry and telecommand, uh, which is in the seven, eight gigahertz range. Um, and for this, we have our main antenna here that will give us data rates between 50 and 348 kilobits per second. I know for you in the room, it sounds ridiculous, but this is what we're working with. And for for uh, anomaly cases, we have another antenna that's mounted on this boom here. You can, you can see the little cone here. It's medium gain antenna. This is mainly there in case we have what we call a safe mode. The spacecraft needs to reconfigure itself and there in, uh, in very uh, nasty cases, it, it cannot really orient itself properly, so it will strobe around the sun line and, and pass the Earth every rotation. We need an antenna with a wider beam for that, so we use a medium gain antenna. The data rates there are quite poor, so they, they very quickly we get below the one kilobit per second range, but okay, it's for anomaly cases, so that's fine. And then we have two low gain antennas, which are somewhere here on the side. We have, I think here, we have one there and one on the other side which is really for backup commanding if we're really, really desperate and for the very few days we stay close to the Earth. So the, this is what we typically use for that. This is the stack in launch configuration. So from tip to tip, um, this is about six meters. Maybe you want to hear some numbers. So the stack will weigh four tons at launch, 1.4 tons of which is propellant, sorry. Um, the, the MPO here is 1.2 tons, about 85 kilos of which is instruments. The M MMO is 255 kilograms with about 40 something kilos of payload. This is the ratio we're talking about. Um, the, what else can I tell you? Uh, the, the dimension, so I said six meters here. We're talking here, the radiator of the MPO, you will see another picture in a minute, is about four meters. Otherwise, the, all these things are about two meters in height and uh, one to two meters in, in width. So this is roughly what we're talking about. Now, maybe another thing I should talk about. Uh, this is a craft. You're used here to vehicles like cars, planes, and so on. Um, this vehicle ha has uh, 88,000 telemetry parameters. These are the things we uh, use to um, understand what it's doing, because when it's far away, we can't open the bonnet anymore. So uh, we operate with it uh, in a sort of virtual reality, if you like, and we only know what the craft is telling us. So the craft is sending to us 88,000 telemetry parameters and a number of messages. So it, it has a notion of packet-based uh, interaction that basically can detect condi conditions and, and report them as a message. Uh, we have about 6,500 telecommands at our disposal to control it. So this is roughly what we're talking about. And for all standards, this is, qualifies as rather complex. So it's, it's, um, it's actually 
in our group, um, the, the, the most complex um, craft we're dealing with so far. I mean, in manned space flight, there is another level of complexity, but for robotic craft, it's, it's quite one of its kind. In order to, to control it, we have what we call a flight operations plan with procedures, because as you can imagine, you don't operate a machine like that by coming in the morning in the control room and saying, hey, what do we do today? So uh, we, we, we proceduralize everything. So we, we, and today, to control it, we have uh, about 1,400 procedures um, that only cover the interplanetary crews and not even all of it. So we cover, at the moment, in detail, the first two years, and then we, we continue as we get along. And all the Mercury domain is, uh, uh, at the moment, not yet uh, encoded into procedures, except for the stuff we need already in the cruise phase. So this gives you a, a feel for what we're talking about. Uh, this is the MTM with its solar panel deployed. So tip to tip is about 30 meters. These solar panels are very important because we carry electric propulsion. So they are what feeds the craft with electricity for this purpose. So they have a performance of about 13.3 kilowatts. Um, just for reference, the MPO alone, when it's around Mercury, consumes about top one kilowatt, say, roughly. So the rest will feed the electric propulsion system. This is a close-up of the MPO. Uh, what I'd like you to remark here is this thing here is our radiator. Bepi Colombo is essentially um, a thermal mission. So if we want to fly into a pizza oven, we, something's got to give. When we started the project, the material database of ESA was going up to 120 degrees Celsius. And this craft will experience temperatures up to 350. So we had to do something. And the doing something, we, I will show you some more close up later, is this beautifully uh, glowy white thermal blanket. And this radiator that's responsible for getting the heat of the spacecraft outside. Okay, I don't know how many of you would like to put your computers in a pizza oven. I wouldn't. So here it's the same. It means that the computers and the electronics that you can see here, it's all electronics there and several computers, needs to be kept at a comfortable room temperature of 50 degrees Celsius top, really maximum, and uh, when it's 350 outside. So we, we have uh, quite a... Uh, uh, th thermal control to make sure that this happens. And the radiator here is responsible for the heat rejection. It's quite cool because you can't see it very well, but these are blades actually. Each, each of these little things here is a metallic blade that is shaped to reflect the uh, infrared heat that, uh, that is reflected by the surface of Mercury itself away from the craft while giving the craft free access to space for heat rejection. So this was also a, a specific development for Bepi Colombo. Uh, by European industry that, uh, that we fly for the first time, essentially. This gives you a feeling for how crowded it is inside. This is just one of the sides of the satellite, so it's full of stuff. <laughs> uh, and this is finally a close-up of our uh, Japanese passenger, Mio. So again, it has its own eigen antenna for telecommunication, uh, and it's a spinner, as I said, so similar to us, they have solar cells and OSRs. They are called this also for thermal balance uh, for, for the craft. And then they have um, basically various appendages that will be deployed once they get into the Mercury environment that you cannot see here, but these pods here will be basically holes for letting things come out. So how do we get there? Now we have a craft and we want to go there. So when it is simple, this is what you do. So in a simple, simple case, Mars Express, Venus Express, you come from the Earth, you want to go to, say, Mars, and you do what's called the Hohmann transfer. Go from here to here with an ellipse. Super simple, takes about six months for Mars. Easy. For Bepi, this is what we do. Sorry, I hope I can play it. So for Bepi, it's not that simple. <laughs> So, in fact, this is why it took that long for mankind to go to Mercury, because uh, we cannot go with a direct transfer. It would cost too much energy. We simply don't have the, the rockets to do that. So, we depart from the Earth with an Ariane 5 launcher at top capacity, and it sends us on a trajectory very similar to the one of the Earth. So, the spacecraft is here, the Earth is there. You can see we follow it very closely. It's very convenient, because then the data rates are still high, so it's around the corner. And then in around Easter next year, we will make a so-called gravity assist of the Earth that will kick us towards the inner solar system in the direction of Venus. Then we will have one, two uh, gravity assists by Venus. The objective of these gravity assists is actually to rotate the plane of the spacecraft uh, orbit to go in the same plane as Mercury itself. Once we are in the same place at Mercury, all we have to do is break. 
to adjust our velocity to that of Mercury itself so that we can enter into orbit. It's said simple, but in reality it takes us several years. Um, of, it will take us six gravity assists by uh, Mercury itself and electric propulsion to actually meet those rendezvous with Mercury each time. So, yeah. Now, gravity assist is a very cool thing. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's a okay, well-known technique in space. Actually, interestingly enough, Mariner 10 was the first mission to use gravity assist by Venus to visit another planet, which is a, quite an, a nice uh, link to our mission as well. Um, you can get a huge energy with gravity assist, much more than with propulsion itself. So it's a very powerful technique. In fact, here, uh, the, the largest part of the delta V, okay, the, the energy um, uh, change, delta V, we call it, we need to get close to Mercury and adjust our velocity to that of Mercury is achieved through the gravity assists. Um, and basically, it functions, it's like a slingshot maneuver. You pass close to a planet, so the planet gravity modifies your trajectory, um, but then as seen from the sun, basically changes the trajectory, so you have a, a, an energy change through that. Uh, that you get practically by exchanging energy with the planet itself. The planet doesn't care, and uh, it's, we get a lot out of it. So in October last year, after a long, long, long waiting time and a lot of headaches, we were finally ready on the launch pad in crew, and in the night from the 19th and 20th, Ariane 5 gave us a beautiful lift up to space. You can watch it on YouTube. It's, uh, I, I'm emotional every time when I see it. Um, it's amazing how quickly this moment passed, <laughs> um, but it was perfect. So they gave us a near-perfect injection, and uh, at uh, 2.12 uh, Zulu, so UTC time, on the morning of the 20th, we were in the control room taking ownership of our beautiful spacecraft here. And this is what then happened. So when the spacecraft gets into space, separating from its rocket, um, we cannot take over control immediately. This would be far too dangerous because at this moment, the spacecraft is very vulnerable. It doesn't have, it, it's on battery, which means it has a very limited energy supply. So what it needs to do, and besides, its um, propulsion system is um, not yet primed so that we minimize the risk that it explodes on the rocket, which would make a very nice show, but not be very uh, nice for otherwise. So we, it's, it's, there are several barriers for the propulsion system to be protected, and those barriers need to be open once the spacecraft separates from the rocket. So all this happens autonomously. There is a sequence that runs that primes the propulsion system and uh, deploys the solar arrays. So you have seen it happening now. And once this is done, um, the spacecraft orients itself uh, around the, the, the sun. Basically, it knows where to look for the sun. Uh, it finds that on its own. It orients itself there, and we have communication on the Logan antenna, and we take over control. And from then onwards, we continue uh, the priming of the satellite, if you like, the putting it into function. So what we did in this case is uh, we checked it out, we activated its star trackers. All of, all of our satellites nowadays have an autonomous uh, onboard attitude determinations uh, through star trackers. This is a, a very important piece of technology. So the spacecraft looks at the sky and knows basically in what orientation it has. Um, and then we, we activated its reaction wheels, which are important for attitude control. And then we transitioned it to what is called its normal mode. Uh, we deployed the high gain and the medium gain antenna, moved the telecommunication to the medium gain antenna in this case because we were still quite close to the Earth, um, and declared the commissioning, the, 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 the first phase of launch and early orbit phase completed. This took us a few days of uh, 24 hours operations. Now, you may wonder, I mean, how do we communicate with these things? I mean, in the first days, obviously, it's very critical. So we like to have contact with the spacecraft 24-7, or actually 24-3, because after three days, we don't look at it 24 hours a day. Um, so for the first few days, it's really round the clock because it's a very delicate phase. But after that, we actually don't want to look at it every minute of every day because it would mean we would need a human being in the control room 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, it's unaffordable, and besides, it's a bit boring, because when the spacecraft is fine and flies through space, there is really not much to do. So normally, we take contact with this uh, craft in routine, will be once per day, for a duration of typically eight hours, um, whereby now, in cruise, when it's quiet, we like to uh, decrease the contact to typically once a week for about eight hours. So we try to pick a ground station that's conveniently overlapping with working hours, and uh, then we, we, we check the spacecraft, we get the data down that it has stored, 
um, we may uplink its commands. So it has a, a table of commands on board uh, that it can execute on its own. We check that there hasn't been any problem. We check the messages it sends us in the meanwhile, and then we let it go for another week. So obviously, these machines need to have quite uh, an intelligence. Now, it's not the intelligence you guys deal with with your research, right? I mean, we don't yet have artificial intelligence of our spacecraft. I don't want to enter the debate whether we should have it. I personally think we're quite far away from it. Um, it brings issues with it, but today, anyway, those machines are very deterministic, which doesn't mean that they are not clever. They can do a lot of things. And Bepi Colombo can fly through space for up to two weeks to a month, completely on its own. If we pre-program it with uh, some ephemeris, uh, it orients itself according to this guidance we gave it, and it's able to save itself, and even if there is one failure in any domain, it will continue. So it's single failure tolerant, there is redundancy everywhere, um, and, and this is the way we operate. So it, it is able to detect key failures that would endanger its, its mission in all domains and react to them, recover for them. Uh, we can also program it to quite an extent. The software that is on board is reprogrammable to some extent. We can patch it, we can even replace it completely if we want. So uh, we, we can really do a lot with the machines that really doesn't require human beings like in the 60s to be there all the time and watch it and send commands every five minutes. So this is quite good. We do all this from our control center in Darmstadt for, in this case. So this is a main control room. This is from where we launch. Actually, once um, the spacecraft is um, in operation after these two days I, I talked about, we move out of this uh, very cool futuristic room into a room that looks more like uh, one of your offices, I mean, which is just uh, a terminal uh, workstations, workspace, uh, which actually we share with other missions. So two days we have one team of controllers, one person in the room 24 seven, but this person controls several of our spacecraft at the same time. In our case, our two Mars mission and Bepi Colombo, one team of operators. So this is quite good, quite, quite common nowadays. Uh, and really, they don't have much to, in, to do interactively because everything, as I said, is pre-programmed. And if we want to do something a bit unusual with the spacecraft, one of our engineers will come in the room and do it. We communicate with the satellites through a network of ground stations all over the world. This here is our um, own is an asset of deep space antenna. There are 35 meters ground station in uh, Australia, New Norcia. This is the first one we built for Rosetta. Then it was followed by one in uh, Spain near Madrid in Cebreros. And uh, the last one a few years ago was built in Argentina at the end of the world a little bit in Malawi. It's a very nice place for an antenna. And with these three, <laughs> we have coverage all around the world, which if we need, gives us round the clock coverage. So for critical phases, this is very, very important. And when our asset is very constrained, because nowadays a lot of people want to use our antenna, actually, we, we have demands from all over the world, from our partner agencies, from private initiatives. Um, that, so the, the, the network is, is very uh, nicely loaded. Uh, we have collaborative agreements with partner agencies. So in the context of BP Colombo, uh, our collaboration with JAXA enables us to use their own deep space asset which is a Yuzuda ground station in Japan. It's uh, actually a 60 something meters dish uh, dedicated to deep space. They use it to communicate with their own super cool interplanetary missions like Hayabusa and so on. Um, but we, we can use it. And DSN, of course, the, the deep space network of NASA, which is a, a super cool asset, again, in very similar locations or longitudes like ours. Uh, but they have multiple dish, dishes in each center, and uh, most of us, sooner or later, we, we work with those stations as well. It's a very precious uh, asset of mankind, this network. And then in terms of uh, control center, we have two main partners, basically. We have the Japanese control center for MIO. Of course, today, MIO is on our shoulders, so um, they have to control it through us. Everything goes through the MPO. But the day MIO will fly on its own, uh, they will be there to operate it, so similar to us. So today already we collaborate very closely with them. And then we have an ISA center in Spain that is in charge of coordinating the scientific requests. Um, so they, they are in charge really of talking to our customer, ultimately the payload, um, and making sure that their requests are conflict free and uh, then pass them on to us for integration with the rest of the spacecraft commands. So here I want to show you a little bit of uh, things from the spacecraft. These are actually not uh, artistic impressions. They are uh, films and images from the spacecraft itself. 
uh, we have the luck to have three monitoring cameras, qu quite primitive actually, they're like webcams that uh, we found. They were integrated very, very late, but they work and uh, they give us uh, Actually, the only visuals we will have for the whole duration of the cruise phase because our cameras are looking at the transfer module right now. So it's, we're very happy to have them. And uh, during the so-called commissioning phase where we tested out the spacecraft and all the instruments, we used them to take some pictures. So you can see here the solar array of the MTM while we rotate it to do some tests. This is the backside with the wires. This is our again antenna here with the MLI that you can see. And here's the boom deployment we did for the magnetometer uh, with a, a close-up of the medium gain antenna. So this we did in, uh, from October to December uh, with typically a contact per day of 10 to 12 hours. So where are we today? Our spacecraft has been thoroughly tested. It has even gone through its first phase of electric propulsion. I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. And this is what lies ahead of us. This is our uh, interplanetary transfer until the arrival in December 2025. This here you can see the sun range, so we will go from 1.2 AU astronomical units. This is the distance sun Earth, um, so it, it's not actually that far. I mean, Jupiter is much further up, but okay. Uh, so we are about to reach our uh, furthest point from the sun for the whole mission. After which we will basically dive into the sun over the years. At the moment, we are conveniently close to the Earth. We are only 31 million kilometers from the Earth with a propagation delay of only 100 seconds. So. Uh, 200 seconds when I send a command. Later on, it will be up to 25 minutes. So when Mercury, we can just go for a coffee while we wait for the answer to a command, uh, which is nice. I mean, at Jupiter, you can go for lunch, so it's uh, even, uh, even worse, but okay. <laughs> Mercury is not so far, so that's fine. Um, yeah, and that's, that's where we are and what lies ahead of us. So, so far, I told you about standard ways to operate spacecraft. Uh, autonomy, communication, this is what we all do in our group. Yeah? It's uh, basically our bread and butter operation. This is not, not particularly ch challenging for BP. This is what we're used to do. But for BP, there are some things that come on top. And one of them is electric propulsion. Electric propulsion is not a new technology per se. I mean, first attempts to use it were shown already in the 60s. And it's flown on many missions. But actually, within ESA, we're the first ones to use it to go to the inner solar system. So basically, to use it for interplanetary transfer. And today, I'm told that the thrust levels we are flying are the highest that are flown into space on, on this day. So we have a capacity to fly uh, a thrust levels of 290 millinewton, uh, with two, uh, two of these four nice engines here, two operating at the same time. So when they operate, this is what you see. This is a, a Xenon a gridded uh, ion engine. Um, blue because uh, Xenon, basically. If you put another gas, it could be another color. And uh, each of these engines can deliver a thrust level of up to 145 millinewton, whereby for reasons that I will not explain here at the moment, we cap it to 125. 125 millinewton is as if you are at sea level and you put three one euro coins in your hand. So that's 24 grams, and that's the thrust you get. But thanks to the fact that we use it continuously, it gives us uh, an enormous delta V of uh, above two kilometers per second in total over the whole duration of the mission. So this is, um, gives you, a, a basically this is a telemetry plot of the thrust level of our four engines when we did the first arc from December to early March. So uh, we changed the thruster pair halfway through to just try them out and balance them out. And the nice curve you see here is simply the evolution of the thrust level as per the, the sun distance. So at the beginning, we were uh, moving a bit closer to the sun, so the thrust level increased a bit, and then we, move, we were moving away, so the thrust level decreased. This is part of the challenge of this. It's basically, we do not have a spacecraft that can give us the maximum affordable thrust all the time. We have to adjust it to what's currently available on our solar arrays. This is a novelty for us. We're used to fly missions where, okay, to, to to put it a bit uh, bluntly, we have spacecraft where one, one of the two solar wings we flew was redundant. So basically we could lose one solar wing and that was okay. On this satellite we cannot because actually we rely on the full um, two wings of the MTM to give us this power. The redundancy we have is in maybe losing a section or losing a small part of it due to a micrometeorite impact or things like that. But otherwise, we really need the full performance to, to get to these thrust levels that the mission relies on to get to Mercury. So that's a big difference. The other thing is that um, the thrust is, of course, it's never really perfect. And the beam is, uh, has some uncertainty and also maybe sometimes the thrust level even. So the performance is excellent. It's exactly as predicted by industry. We are very happy, but still, 
you're dealing with a dynamic system here. It's plasma, it's not super stable. So it means that we need to have a closed loop. Basically, the spacecraft flies and does its thrust, and then we have to check how it impacts the orbit to, so that we adjust the parameters for the next increment. And in order to be accurate enough for our needs, this cycle needs to be done on a biweekly basis. So basically, we do orbit determination every week, and then we uh, compile the, the new trajectory, get new commands. We have to crunch the new commands, uplink the new commands to the spacecraft, re replace the old one, and, and, and do that every week. So it's very heavy. I mean, we, when we had ballistic satellites, we could leave them for months, and they would fly their trajectory happily, or Rosetta for even years sometimes, ballistically flying through space, not needing to change anything. Here, we have to basically replace commands every week, and we're talking some thousands of commands. Also, the, the automatic process to transition into this mode is um, it's highly autonomous, but it's very complex, and it takes time. So this is a, a new field for us, extremely interesting, very successful so far, new application, if you like, for our needs, um, but it's a challenge. The other challenge I've already briefly mentioned was thermal. So they're all, I've already talked about that. I will not mention it much more, but we had to develop new uh, uh, material for this. You can see it here. And what I wanted to emphasize on these view graphs is that those spacecrafts are not a, a picture of the mind. They rely on handicraft. You can see here uh, highly expert tailors actually sewing the thermal blankets on the spacecraft. And their job is critical because if they screw up and we have a heat leak, then it can cost us a mission. So it's not just uh, nicely thinking and programming in our offices software and so on. These machines have a, a very heavy component of, of, uh, of handicraft that I personally find remarkable. Then we have other challenges ahead of us. After seven years of marriage, we have to separate the craft. So uh, we will first separate the MTM when we arrive to Mercury. Then we will come into orbit using uh, a new technique. This is uh, called weak stability boundaries. It's basically a game of playing with gravity. The idea is you get to a small gate in time and space. If you get through this gate at that moment with that energy level, you enter in an orbit around the sun and you exit in an orbit around Mercury. Again, beautiful on paper, very simple idea, but we will have to pull it through to implement it. This requires very precise navigation. And then after that, the spacecraft will be bound to Mercury, but not in the orbit we need for science. So we will have a sequence of uh, 15 maneuvers spaced by only a few days here. This is also very challenging with two further module separations along the way before we reach our scientific orbit. So these are two uh, pictures of the module separation of the MMO first and then of the MOSIF that we will not need anymore. This sequence is, uh, costs us about 920 uh, meters per second. So it's again a very large delta V that is required to enter into orbit. And then finally, we will reach our, our goal. Yeah, hard to believe, but uh, the journey is, uh, is tough, but this is actually what we want to do. And uh, this mission will, um, is baseline to last two years. But actually, the MPO is predicted to stay in a stable orbit around Mercury for at least 50 years. So if the environment is, um, well, the env environment will be harsh. But if our design is robust enough and the spacecraft survives, we may have more time. But the baseline is two years. The spacecraft uh, flies an orbit of 2.3 hours around the planet. Um, this is quite a challenge as well, because it means that if you have an interruption of contact, over this orbit of 2.3 hours, this repeats 10 times a day. So you can imagine I'm here with my nice 10 hours pass, and I, I basically get micro passes of 20 minutes. So I have to, to, to salami slice my, my commands and my communication to basically stop and restart and stop and restart with a propagation delay of 20 minutes. So this is uh, quite interesting. We're already doing this with one of our missions at Mars, but it's, it's quite fun. And the other thing is that this satellite is designed to operate continuously. So because the mission is so short, um, we, uh, we need to have the payload active all the time, which means we do everything at the same time, all the time. And we, we, we want not to have a disruption of service. So it's really our job to make sure that this goes smoothly on this very intense uh, plan of operations. Finally, I should say that we are in a pizza oven and our solar arrays that uh, would have nicely have a temperature a limit of 350 degrees. They don't. We didn't manage to qualify them that high. We managed to qualify them to 200 degrees only. And this took us a lot of sweat and headaches. Uh, blood, sweat, and tears, Churchill would say. So that was really difficult. As a result, we operators, we have to embed a thermal prediction software in our operation software to orient the solar array according to the predicted temperature it will have. 
and around the orbit, so the, uh, the array moves all the time like this, and it's based on predictive software based on ground, which is also something we do for the first time. For us, it's quite a challenge. Now, I'm reaching the end of my time, so I'd like to acknowledge the hard work of many brilliant and talented people across Europe and the world. These are really team, um, team projects in, in the uh, true sense of the, of the word. We cannot do that with single individuals. We need the team. So you can see some, some colleagues here, the, the, some colleagues who built the satellite and some of the colleagues who uh, designed and operated. This is a mission control team. This is people who um, took care of the launch of BP. And I'm extremely grateful to all of them because without them, we don't have a mission, basically. And with these words, I'd like to give you a rendezvous to uh, check again with us in April next year for our swing by. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure there are questions. Please. Hi, so the first question I had is, um, <laughs> you are flying for like eight years and you have to plan this gravitation analysis very well. Can you tell us a little bit about how you do that, how the, that plan goes? Yeah, or sure. Went? And well, the second question mm -hmm. I had, if, if you have enough time, is <laughs> yeah. Mercury is going to hide behind the sun for two, twice during, during that time. How is the date transmission uh, plan yeah. to happen? Yeah, these are two, two, two very uh, interesting uh, questions. Thank you. So basically, for the gravity assist, indeed, we have to navigate extremely precisely. So this is always a, a question of uh, uh, doing a rendezvous in space, essentially. Huh? When you do a swing by, you have to uh, get to a certain point with a certain velocity and a certain orientation at a certain time. This is what it is. So our colleagues from Flight Dynamics, it's a very uh, extremely talented group in ISOC, who is uh, world class. They are the people who landed Philae on the comet. They work also with us on this project. And uh, every week, they determine the orbit of Bepi Colombo using uh, radio frequency observables, like uh, ranging and Doppler data. Uh, we use also um, uh, Delta Door, so these are uh, techniques using quasars. Uh, so this is another, another uh, technique, uh, measurement we do. In particular, for the Venus and Mercury flybys, we use that. Um, and, and basically, we, we, we do this all the time. But when we come close to the flyby, we do it in a more uh, intensified basis, if you like. And then we have slots to correct the trajectory of the, of the spacecraft such that we reach that point. And uh, usually, okay, we have very good track records. Uh, we've, we've done this for uh, other of our missions. Rosetta had four flybys, so we, we know how to do this. But uh, still, it's, um, it, it, it's very delicate and, and expert work to do that. So the, in, in a sense, it's using radio frequency observables to do the navigation, uh, combined with, uh, with the propulsion to target the craft accurately. And then you're right, the spacecraft, not only around Mercury, but also during its interplanetary cruise, regularly passes behind the sun as seen from the Earth. This is called conjunction. Um, it, it's very common in our business, and depending on which orbit you are flying, the conjunction duration can be of the order of a week or 12 days. This is when we are at Mercury. This is the duration we're talking about. Up to uh, a few months, in fact, yeah? I mean, uh, Rosetta, I think, a uh, long conjunction we had was like uh, of the order of 30 days. And there, well, you can't actually communicate with the craft. Um, we normally, we use conservative assumptions that below five degrees angular distance between the sun and the, and the, and the probe seen from the Earth, uh, we will start seeing severe degradation on this, uh, of the signal. And we assume for design purposes that below three degrees, we have a blackout. And actually, when we communicate in X-band, this is pretty much what we see, okay? You can tune the thing a little bit, but this is, this is uh, confirmed by, by practice, if you like. If you use other frequency bands, which we have on Bepi Colombo, we have KA ba band as well, this 30, 32 gigahertz uh, frequency. When you use that, you can get closer, actually. But uh, we, we only have it in the downlink, and uh, this is a frequency that is very uh, sensitive to the amount of water in the atmosphere, so it brings other problems with it. The downlink might not be very reliable unless you put other techniques on top. So for design purposes, we, we assume these two values. And then our spacecraft has to be autonomous accordingly. So it is able to survive for a few weeks without us. So we pre-program it, and then we close our eyes and hope to find it again three weeks later. Usually we do. <coughs> yeah, so this, um, this gravity assist maneuver that you do, um, how often are the launch windows to Mercury? 
Yeah, this is another very interesting question. Actually, uh, in this case, um, we had launch windows practically every six months. And this is not a given, really, by far. If you take a Mars mission, typically they have launch opportunities every two years or so, uh, if they go ballistic. But here, what is saving us is electric propulsion. Because with electric propulsion, you can actually adjust the trajectory while you fly and make a rendezvous that by ballistic means you couldn't, you couldn't make. The other trick we play is a, is a game of the Earth swing by. So by, doing, uh, by having a, a gravity assist by the Earth, it resets the trajectory, if you like, compared to launching uh, directly to, because ideally what we would have liked is launch directly to Mercury, impossible, but directly to Venus. We could have done that because actually what the trajectory needs is a two flyby at Venus to rotate it and then the, the breaking down maneuvers in the Mercury environment. And we had some options with direct transfer to Venus, but those were extremely rare. So what gives us these uh, very frequent uh, opportunities is the electric propulsion, essentially. So in our case, we had opportunities every six months, which is both uh, a blessing and a curse, because when we had uh, difficulties in the program, well, we have opportunities every six months, so it's very tempting to basically just delay by six months. But uh, you don't solve your problems in six months. You delay by six months, and then another six months, and another six months, and then uh, before you notice, it's, it's four years. So <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> but okay, it's, it's a part of the business. So, the, yeah. <coughs> Thanks, very interesting talk. Um, one question, if you say that the electric uh, energy system is so critical, why don't you build an additional redundancy of a, uh, like a third solar array into that? We can't afford it. Yeah, this is a simple question. We can't afford it. Actually, this mission was designed as a 2.8 ton spacecraft to launch on Soyuz at the, at initially. Actually, at the very early days, it even had a lander on it, but then the lander died very early. Uh, but uh, when, when we kicked off uh, the contract with industry, we were still hoping that we could launch on a Soyuz rocket with 2.3, 2.8 tons. And uh, very quickly, it turned out it was not possible. And then we had to basically cap the main uh, growth parameters, which in a sense is also the, the length of the solar panel, the electrical capacity. And to be honest, frankly, I think having an extra solar wing, it's overdone. Uh, so I, I don't disagree with the design principle we, are, we have uh, chosen on our mission, which is to basically we have some conservative uh, assumptions for the redundancy, that uh, we take some worst cases, we build some failure scenarios in, but realistic ones, not ones that uh, we, we lose an entire wing. Now, of course, in space, funny things happen. I mean, we have a mission where actually during the integration, it was uh, 20 years ago, uh, more than 10 years ago, uh, the, the things were wrongly wired between, between the power conditioning unit and the solar array. So when they arrived in space, they realized that at the end, I think they lost uh, maybe one third of their power due to that. Because they were ballistic and they had a lot of margin, they could still do the mission with this, and we couldn't have. But these are questions that you address by quality processes and uh, thoroughly checking on Earth and things like that, so um, that's fine. Now, the, the point I wanted to make is that operationally, we are, you know, we are progressing. So uh, maybe 10, 20 years ago, uh, it was difficult to fly these things, still having this huge redundancy. Now we know how to do that. So we, we basically reduce the thing. And this means now for this mission that we have to manage the solar generation uh, resource, which on previous spacecraft, we didn't have to think about it. When I worked on Rosetta, the solar array generation power was not a parameter I ever looked at because I knew I had plenty. On this one, we have to because we cannot afford to go into, into deep, deep discharge. So, so it just brings another uh, thing with it. But this is normal life, so it, it's fine. Yeah, first, thank you very much for your talk. Um, this, I have two questions about electric propulsion. Like the first one is, you said you have a plasma of xenon. So how much xenon you take with you for the whole flight? And the second question is, um, you said it was never used before for inner planets, but it's not really designed for inner planets because the closer you get to the sun, the more energy you have to, to use <laughs> in the end? Yeah, okay. That, two very, very interesting questions. So the amount of xenon, now I don't have the exact uh, um, uh, embarked uh, um, mass on top of my head, but basically for the whole composite we of four tons, we carry 1.4 ton of propellant, actually a large part of it, not all of it. I mean, we have a lot for the MPO uh, chemical for the insertion. The rest is electric propulsion, so it's, it's going to be several hundred kilos. Um, now, the question about closing, coming closer to the sun and having more power. This is very, very interesting because everybody thinks that, and actually on BP, because the solar array didn't make the 350 degrees Celsius, we are power constrained at perihelion. So when we are the closest to the sun is when we have the worst power constraint ever in the mission, that we actually have to uh, time, timeline the, the payload operation and we have to constrain them, squeeze them to the minimum just to be able to operate. 
And this has to do with this uh, temperature effect. You need to develop cells that work well at high temperature. And I'm sorry to say, but we're not there yet, not fully. So we have a mission. We're very happy about that. It costs us a lot of hard work, but it's a great achievement to have that. But they are not sufficient to give us uh, plenty of power uh, when we are 0.3 AU from the sun, which, okay, is counterintuitive, but it's like that. In fact, I, I will tell you another thing. It's also funny, it's a nice anecdote actually, for the electric propulsion. So you say you could fly close to Mercury, you're gonna be hot, it's all fine, right? One of the difficulties they had in the design is because the thrusters are shielded from the sun actually. Uh, they had to qualify them for operating at minus 150 degrees, the engines, yeah? So it, it's, uh, it, it's not as you would expect at, at, first, uh, at first sight. But okay, it's, um, it brings advantages on, on the ratio you gain for payload. So uh, it's a bit borderline in our case, truth be told. But generally, when you look at the mass budgets with EP, you regain margin for, for payload. And this is why pe people do that. Yeah. And uh, we're very happy to inv invest in this technology because there is a lot of interest for it now uh, worldwide. And uh, this basically allowed us to mature European technologies that uh, might find other applications. So this is also one why we do this uh, in the end. Okay, we are not a technology demonstrator mission, but you know if you get that along the way, it's also a nice side effect. So. Questions? Um, could you elaborate a bit more on the decision to put two orbiters into two different orbits? I guess there's some science that you can only do in one orbit, but also you could just use an, uh, a long elliptic orbit. Or what, what wrote this yeah. decision? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, indeed. It's uh, uh, driven by the scientific needs. So uh, Mercury is an object that is uh, quite small that uh, you want, in order to study the surface and the composition and so on, you want to fly as close as possible to it. But if you want, it has also a magnetic field. And if you want to study the magnetic field and the, the boundary, I'm not a scientist myself, so excuse my lack of precision in the wording, but if you want to study like the bow shock and all these things that have to do with magnetic fields, you need to fly further away. Now, one thing we don't have on this spacecraft is we do not have the capability, once we're in orbit, to maintain our orbit. So we were so mass constrained that actually from the very, very beginning, we decided we do not want to embark fuel on that because this is more mass that we cannot give to our payload. So once we are around orbit, uh, around the, uh, in orbit around Mercury, or our own orbit will evolve naturally. We do not have fuel to change it. So we do not have fuel to actually go from a close orbit to a far away orbit to an outdoor orbit to rotate the argument of pericenter, etc. We do not have fuel to do that. So uh, the choice, because we have two crafts, is then to make the best out of it and have one dedicated to the composition, the geology, uh, the blah, blah, at close, and one dedicated to the magnetic field, the interaction with the solar wind, etc., large. And, and, and that's, uh, that, that's a nice way of solving it. So two crafts, two orbits. Plus, okay, the scientists are super happy because they get points uh, at completely different, uh, simultaneous points, at, at different points in the, in the Hermian environment. So for them, it's very valuable, this actually. And it's, if you think about it, what's the chance that uh, you, you get points like that at Mercury? You only get it if you send two crafts at the same time. This is almost never the case. So I have one question about the solar panels. Um, I mean, on Mars, there's strong, except the high heat, there's also a strong radiation. Yeah. Um, so I assume that this will degrade the power of those very strongly. So yes. would that be one of the main points that limits the, the baseline of two years you mentioned for this mission? Yes, it's not impossible that we get limited by that. In fact, uh, we also expect the MLI, so the thermal blankets, to uh, become brown very quickly. So it's gonna, we're going to have to see how much of their uh, properties are retained in such a radical environment, uh, which is why on, in the baseline we commit for one year with a built-in extension of two years because we know the environment is tough. On the other hand, and you are very right that um, the, the solar panels are, will be subject to extreme uh, conditions which will lead to uh, visible degradation. And this we have spent a lot of effort actually testing and studying these effects so that we can build them into our budgets uh, because we are so marginal, if you like, in some, in some situations. So we think we have a good understanding and a good grip on what the evolution can be and we, we, we will have means to um, monitor that in flight actu actually to some extent. Um, having said that, we have so far very, very good experience with the robustness of our satellites. I have to say, 
I mean, uh, across the solar system, industry has built for us spacecraft for missions of a few years, three years, five years, etc. Take Mars Express, it was launched in 2003, where 2019 is still happily going and predicted to go for God knows how long. These things are, uh, they do a very good job. Yeah? And uh, I personally think in, in Europe, we, we put a lot of uh, emphasis on the quality processes and the testing. And uh, this is the result. I mean, you get machines that uh, give you good return on your investment by living much longer than their design life. So personally, I would have some hope that within these uh, uh, margins, if you like, that are built in here and there, um, and, and the worst cases that we have taken into account, that, that we will squeeze out a little bit more. I would then dream 20 years like Mars Express, but uh, even if we get two more years, I mean, one Mercury year is three months. It already, uh, you know, doubles our, uh, our extended mission. This would, be, this would be awesome, actually, for the scientists. It's eight more orbits, so I think this would already be good. In any case, we are trying to uh, make the best out of our aging spacecraft, monitor the, the degradation of performance, and then try to get them going for as long as they can. And uh, we have good track records doing that, so we'll see. So the last quick question. Uh, thank you very much for the exciting talk. Um, I've got uh, the question whether you also collect data um, in deep space or during the flybys of Earth and Venus. Yeah, that's, that's also a very interesting question. We, we do, but not as much as we would like because of our very peculiar configuration. So it, it's normally very common to fly this observatory like Rosetta for 10 years in space and then really take every opportunity you have along the way to make science. And we like doing that. It's never in the baseline, but we do it anyway. Now, in this case, the problem is that the, 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 the cameras and the spectrometers, they are mounted on the side of the MPO that looks towards the MTM, which also preserves them from, from degradation to some extent, but means that the super nice uh, camera with stereo effect and uh, high resolution is only going to look at the MTM for seven years. So and that's not very exciting, right? So uh, luckily, out of uh, our 11 instruments, um, we have a lot of in-situ instruments that can be operated. And in fact, they are. Now, they are not so fascinating for the general public. You're not going to find a, a magnetometer spectra on the front page of Le Monde. Or, uh, or, uh, but but they, they do return valuable data. And our community is extremely excited about acquiring regular data in the interplanetary inter, uh, space. There is good science cases for doing so. So at the moment, as we speak, we have four of our instruments on in the background all the time collecting data, which are the magnetometer, the accelerometer, because this arguably is more for calibration and stabilities and real science, but it, they, they need to understand the environment to be performant scientifically, so it's, it's relevant. And uh, um, the, the um, gamma ray uh, spectrometer. And which has a view on, onto space, so they, they're happy to collect data along the way. So those are on, and we have a few more that uh, are extremely interested in gathering data. They are still being partially commissioned and tested right now. So we have another, I think, two or three that uh, in the course of the years will, will also be part of the package. So at the end of the day, we'll end up operating two-thirds of the package. Only the ones that have a view on the MTM will not be operated, which I think is not bad, not part of the baseline. <laughs> so. so this was the last question. Thank you very much again. You're welcome.